اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ان الانسان لفی خسر الا الذین آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر By the token of time verily all humankind will be in a state of loss except for those who believe and do righteous deeds and in joining truth and in joining patience this is found in the Quran chapter 103 called Surat Al-Asr Mr. Chairman my brothers and sisters and my dear guests I welcome you all with the Islamic greetings of Assalamu Alaikum this was the greetings of all the prophets of God including Jesus in the Gospel of Luke chapter 24 verse 36 when Jesus sees his disciples he says to them peace be unto you which is assalamu alaikum Islam is the only non-christian faith which makes it an article of faith for its followers to believe in Jesus Christ no Muslim is a Muslim if it does not believe we believe that Jesus was one of the mightiest messengers of God we believe that he healed those born blind, the leper and the sick, and he raised the dead by God's permission. We believe that he was born miraculously, which many modern day Christians do not believe in today. I bear witness and testify that none has the right to be worshipped except Allah, the one true God. And I bear witness and testify that Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him and all the prophets, that he's the final messenger of God. Tonight's topic, did Jesus die for the sins of the world? I would like to examine this question from two different perspectives. First, from the Quranic perspective, and second, from the Christian perspective. First, from the Quranic perspective, did Jesus die for the sins of the world? The answer is no. According to the Quran, Jesus did not die, but God raised him alive into the heavens, and Jesus will return in the last days. Secondly, from the Quranic perspective, no one dies for someone else's sins. It is quite clear in the Quran that everyone will be held responsible for their own actions. We will be judged according to what we do, not according to what someone else has done against us or for us. In fact, to say that someone else died for my sins would make that someone else to suffer in my place. And from the Quranic perspective, that will be unjust. This will be a matter of penalizing an innocent person in order for the guilty person to go free. So from the perspective of the Quran, we can say the answer is no. Jesus did not die for the sins of the world. But how do we deal with our Christian friends with the sin problem? They wonder, how do Muslims get forgiveness for sins? The answer to that is God does forgive sins. It doesn't hurt God in any way. If you or I sin, it doesn't take away His greatness. It does not reduce His power in any way if we sin. If we sin, we only hurt ourselves. That is why we are taught to say, Our Lord, we have wronged our souls. And if He don't forgive us, then surely we are the losers. But you notice in the prayer, we say we have wronged our souls. Not that we have wronged God in any way. Because we cannot reduce the status of God or take away anything from His glory by our sinning. Our sinning hurts us. So we ask God to forgive us for our sins. Can God forgive? The answer is yes, He can. God created us knowing that we are going to sin. From the Quran, we know, when God created Adam and Eve, He created them deliberately knowing that they are going to sin. In Surah Al-Baqarah, which is uh, chapter 2 in the Quran, when God declared that He was going to create Adam, the angels asked, Are you going to create beings who spread corruption and do wrong? And we the angels worshipping you and you alone? God replied, I know what you do not know. God created human beings deliberately knowing that they are going to be sinners. For what purpose, you might ask? Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, said, 
If human beings do not commit sins, God will wipe them out and bring instead human beings who would commit sins and ask God for forgiveness and God will forgive them. One of the purposes for God creating us is to exercise his ability to forgive sins. He created us knowing that we will sin and also willing to forgive us for that sin if we are willing to return to him. The Prophet peace and blessing be upon him said that every child of Adam is a sinner but the best of sinners are those who repent. Every child of Adam, in other words, all humanity and the best amongst them are the ones who repent. We see then that God according to the Muslim view does not require from us 100% accuracy in everything that we do. God expects us to be failures at some point in some way. And God is willing to overlook these shortcomings and he is willing to set our matters right for us as long as we turn to him repentant and ask him to repair our circumstances and mend our deeds. God created us knowing that we are going to sin and he is willing to forgive us for our sins. There is however one sin, my dear brothers and sisters and my dear guests, there is one sin which God does not forgive. If you die in that state, and that is associating partners to God. In other words, taking someone else to be worshipped instead of God, or saying some things about God which implies that he has partners or associates. For example, saying that God has a son. Or certain associates or mediators between human beings and God. Mediators who can dictate for God who to forgive or who not to forgive. According to the Quran, God retains his absolute power in every way and nobody can limit that power in any way. To say any such thing and to limit the power of God and make him equal to someone else or make someone else equal with him is the most unforgivable sin in Islam. In order to be forgiven for that sin, one has to turn away completely. Ask God to forgive them. And there is one simple way of doing that is by embracing the religion of Islam. The Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, said, when a person embraces Islam, all his and her previous sins are forgiven that very moment. So to put it in a nutshell, the answer in Islam is no. Jesus didn't die for the sins of the world. He did not even die yet. Let us turn for a moment to the biblical perspective to see what we could find there. Did Jesus die for the sins of the world? We have two answers. First answer is no. He didn't die for the sins of the world and that answer comes from the Bible. The second answer is yes he did die for the sins of the world and that answer also comes from the Bible. It just so happens the Bible was written by so many persons over the centuries. And some of, the, some of these persons had different understandings to what God teaches. One such person in particular, by the name of Paul, who said that he was a disciple of Jesus and that Jesus appeared to him as a bright light and Jesus gave him a message to preach to the people. The answer in his writings is yes, Jesus did die for the sins of the world. I would like to give you the other answer for the moment and then I'll come back to Paul's answer. The answer from the majority of the text in the Bible is that Jesus did not die for the sins of the world. <clears throat> First, it is quite clear. First, it is quite clear in the Bible that human beings will be judged according to their own actions. It is said in the Gospel of Matthew, the angels will come towards the last day to take the people. The angels will separate them based on what they have done. Those who have done good will go into everlasting life. And those who have done evil will go into everlasting suffering and damnation. So it is quite clear that the deeds of the individuals are going to be judged. We find furthermore in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5 to live by the commandments. We see the deeds are emphasized by Jesus. He told them also, for example, that you must act like their forefather Abraham did. He said, if you truly want to be the children of Abraham, then you must do the things which Abraham did. So he, Jesus, emphasized action 
right conduct. He emphasized the things which Muslims also emphasize. Prior to the writings of Paul, it is quite clear that humans do not need someone to die. In the Old Testament, it says that if you commit sins, you should sacrifice an animal and God will forgive you. Many times, at least 14 times. According, according to the book of Leviticus, Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, that's when they used to take two goats. One of them sacrificed and blood spilled at the altar and the other goat, all sins of the people placed upon the second goat and then it, it will run into the wilderness. This goat will, they will let it run into the wilderness. But keep in mind, the goat which the sins of the people placed upon runs off into the wilderness without getting sacrificed. So there is a way to get rid of your sins without having anyone dying for you. Therefore, there was no reason to have a human being die in their place. The Bible also shows that no one can die for the sins of the guilty person. On one occasion, it was quite clear that God was angry with the people of Israel because they continuously disobeyed God. So Moses stood up to plead for them. He said, God, let these people go. Forgive them. Otherwise, if you won't forgive them, then block me out of the book of life. In other words, erase my name of the book of life. But look what God says. God replied to Moses, according to the Bible, that God would not penalize the innocent person to let the guilty go free. So Moses does not have to be blotted out of the book of life. So God is willing to forgive people even without having someone else blotted out from the book of life. So according to the Bible's answer, it is no for someone to die for your sins. You bear your own sins. And this is uh, clearly found in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18, verse 20 to 23. The soul that sins is the one to die, not someone else in place of that one person. Also, Jesus mentions in John, chapter 17, verse 3 to 4. He mentions, he has now completed the work which God gave him to do. But keep in mind, he was still alive. He had not been arrested yet to be crucified. What is that work? Is what he had preached to the people. I want to also examine the writings of Paul in the Bible to see why he also gives a different answer. So according to the Quran, he did not die. According to the majority of the Bible, he didn't die. How is it then we have the opposite answer? That yes, Jesus died for the sins of the world. I've already indicated it comes from the writings of Paul. He became a very influential teacher in Christianity. Now we know there are 27 books in the New Testament. More than half of these books are by Paul or his disciples which make up the Pauline doctrine. The idea about Adam and Eve eating from the tree and to repair this, someone has to die to wipe out this sinful nature. First, Adam sinned and brought death into the world. It is said by Paul in his letters to the Romans that the wages of sin is death and the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Because of the sacrifice of Jesus, now humans can get eternal life. First man brings death, referring to Adam. Second man now brings life, referring to Jesus. According to Paul's writings, it was essential for Christ to die and raise up to eternal life. Jesus had to act as the high priest in order to approach God and get him to forgive our sins. Because the high priest in the Old Testament used to go into the sacred region of the temple and present offerings of the people to God. So according to Paul, this new high priest, i.e. Jesus, now goes up to God and takes himself as an offering to God. Now we know... Uh, the early church was split into two major portions. You had the disciples of Jesus on one hand, and you had Paul and his disciples following an entirely different stream. The one which became dominant was Paul's version. This is the same school which eventually selected what should be in the New Testament. So when you read the New Testament, you are getting which is closely associated to Paul. You are not getting the teachings of Jesus, but you are getting the teachings of Jesus according to this school of thought, according, according to the Pauline doctrine. So when you are reading, you are reading from the perspective that Jesus died for the world. 
Because Paul said, if Jesus was not crucified and raised from the dead, then our teachings is in vain. Paul also says that Jesus died according to my gospel. That's Paul's teachings. Keep in mind, the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, were written after Paul. So they were influenced one way or another by the writings of Paul. So that was the gospel Paul was preaching. So he had his own understanding of what the gospel is. So he could call it my gospel. According to Paul, that was the main point in the gospel, that Jesus died for the sins of the world. The gospels came after the letters of Paul, so they tried to explain one way or another why Jesus had to die for the sins of humankind. I would like to mention also I would like to mention also how the image of Jesus regarding events leading up to the crucifixion how the stories have been modified and reworked over time. Now the reason why we can't tell is because we read the Bible vertically. Or any book, you read it from top to bottom. But try to read the Gospels horizontally from uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and put the stories you know, side by side uh, and you'll see how the image of Jesus leading up to the crucifixion has been reworked and modified over time. Now it is commonly accepted that out of the four Gospels, Mark is the earliest, although uh, in the Bible it's Matthew that's shown first. Then uh, Matthew, Luke and John is the last Gospel, according to the majority of the Christians. According to our Christian friends, Jesus was a willing sacrifice. Now if Jesus is willing to die, why would Jesus pray for death to be taken away from him? According to Mark chapter 14, verse 34 to 36, this is the incident of, uh, in, in the Garden of Gethsemane when he falls on his face and he prays to God. And also it's found in Matthew and Luke. In the earlier Gospels that's found. So he's not praying to be a willing sacrifice. But if you go to the Gospel of John, which is the last Gospel, this scene is absent. Why? It's not there. Because in the Gospel of John, he wants to portray Jesus as he's in full control of the situation, not weak, not God saving him, but Jesus came to save the world. In the Gospel of John, chapter 12, when Jesus enters to Jerusalem, he says something which, which reminds us of that prayer. But he says something opposite. He says, my soul is troubled. He did not say, oh Father, save me from this hour. No, it is for this very reason I have come for this hour. This is in the Gospel of John. Not only the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane is missing in the early Gospels, but in the Gospel of John, he visibly demonstrates a different Jesus. A Jesus that, that does not pray the, the prayer that he prayed earlier. The earlier Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Jesus gets arrested. Even in the Gospel of John, he gets arrested. But it's different. In the Gospel of John, he doesn't really get arrested. He gives himself up because that's his plan. In John chapter 18, he says, No one can take my life away from me because I have been given the authority to lay down my life and to take it up again. Jesus comes forward and gives his life up. But in the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, which are the earlier Gospels, Jesus is not willing to die on the cross. But in the, in the Gospel of, of John, which is the later Gospel, Jesus seems willing to die. In the earlier Gospels, he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But in the Gospel of John, he doesn't say it. Because this will make him appear weak, unwilling, and forsaken that he was hoping for something else than what eventually happened. But in the Gospel of John, instead of saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus says, This is finished, and then he dies. So the impression you get is a man who had to accomplish something. And when that thing is accomplished, he says, It is finished, then lets his soul out. As if he has come into the world specifically for this, to die for the sins of the world. So my point here is you can see how the story has been reworked to appear differently than the earlier Gospels. You can see how the image of Jesus was transformed over time. I will conclude it, inshallah. Now what are the problems that we find with this concept that Jesus died for the sins of the world? First, we see that it is unjust. Penalizing an innocent person to let the guilty person go free. 
Second, makes God look cruel and Jesus look loving if he was willing to die. Number three, it makes it look like God is powerless. He has to give his son over to the devil. He has to give up his son in order to get something. But we know that God is all powerful. Number four, if you say Jesus died for us, that will make God have no claim upon the human beings. God can no longer penalize us for the sins we commit because our sins are already paid for. What makes a person really refrain from sins, my dear brothers and sisters and my dear guests, is because they know God is going to question them for it. If someone died for our sins, then logically God cannot penalize us for our sins. So you see there is a number of problems by saying Jesus died for our sins. So the solution, the solution for someone who wants to follow the Bible today is that the Bible has two answers. One that is reasonable and the other not so reasonable. So stick with the reasonable position, which is already there in the Bible. So when one comes to that position, then one finds him or herself closer to what the Quran already teaches. Because you will find that with the majority of what the Bible teaches, that no way could Jesus have died for the sins of the world. How does one then get forgiveness for his or her sins? One gets forgiveness by following the message which God revealed in the Bible and revealed finally in the last of all of his books, the Quran. Therefore, I would like to invite all of you to follow the message revealed in his last and final revelation, which is the Qur'an. I will end it with a final hadith, inshallah, on the authority of Anas. May Allah be pleased with him, who said, I heard the Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him, say that Allah the Almighty, God Almighty, has said, O son of Adam, referring to all humanity, as long as you call upon me and ask of me, I shall forgive you for what you have done, and I shall not mind. O son of Adam, were your sins to reach the clouds of the sky and were you then to ask forgiveness of me, I would forgive you. O son of Adam, were you to come to me with sins nearly as great as the earth and were you then to face me, ascribing no partner to me, I would bring you forgiveness nearly as great as it. So this emphasizes the dangers of shirk, associating partners to God Almighty. This is our concept of the mercy, grace of God. Not the shedding of blood or torturing of Jesus. Not the crucifixion of Jesus. This is the God of mercy and grace.